Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Again, it's always great to see all of you here and to be with you, to uh, be able to worship in spirit and in truth the true and living God. It always is a great blessing. It has been said, I've heard before, that within the pages of the Bible are the answers to man's most pressing needs. I've also heard uh, another phrase coined like this, that the name Bible, or the term, uh, the acronym for B-I-B-L-E, is basic instructions before leaving earth. Uh, And, you know, I think these are two very good uh, ways to think about God's Word. Uh, it's, a, it's a very important document. It's very important for us. And this morning, I would just simply like to remind us and speak about some of those things uh, about God's Word and the authority of God's Word. For example, point number one, we need to understand that God's Word is inspired. It is inerrant. That is, there are no mistakes in it. It is truly the Word of God from cover To cover. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 36, there the scripture tells us that the word came from God through Christ. We also know that it is inspired and that it furnishes us. For example, 2 Timothy chapter uh, 3 and verse 16 says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So that word is God-breathed. That's what the words literally mean there in that particular passage. And as it already indicates, it, is, it fully furnishes us to every good work. You remember in that prayer that Jesus prayed to the Father before he went uh, onto the cross and he was praying there and he said uh, to sanctify them, that is the apostles, sanctify them by thy truth, Thy word is truth. So even Jesus, the Son of God, recognizes that God's word is truth. In Romans chapter 3, if you have your Bibles, I would like for you to turn to this particular passage with me. In Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Because there it it brings out a principle uh, that I want to basically conclude our sermon this morning with. In Romans chapter 3, verse 1, it says, What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? And so he offers up this question to the listeners of Rome. Uh, You know, what was the advantage of being a Jew? And notice what it says here in verse 2. Much every way, or actually, chiefly, or for the most part, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. The authority of God was committed to the Jews. Uh, They were to carry that that message from God uh, until it was time for a new message to come about, as we know, which is the New Testament. And uh, it says there in verse 3, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, yes, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. And so he's talking about the truth of God's word and how how the Jews were a vessel to carry the oracles or the word of God. Uh, And we do know that they carried the written documents. Those scribes would write it down. And, and they, were, they were hallowed, they were holy, and they carried them everywhere they went, and they protected them. And so God's word is inspired, it's God-breathed, God gave it to us, it is the truth, uh, there's no mistakes in it. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 17, it tells us to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And then ultimately we know by way of John chapter 12 and verse 48 that we're going to be judged by the word of God. We're not going to be judged by our neighbors. You're not going to be judged by the church. You're not going to be judged by the preacher, the pastor, the elder, the prayer books, or any other type of judgment that's going to be made. We're simply going to be measured and judged by the words that the Lord spake. And he, that was what John, uh, John chapter 12 and verse 48 makes reference to. So... 
Point number one, the authority of the Bible, we know that it is inspired and it is the inerrant word of God. Number two, it is complete. It is unified and indestructible. In 2 Peter chapter 1, in verse 3, there the scripture tells us that uh, it has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. You see, we don't need anything else. There's so many people that have this mindset in the religious world that they need something else besides God's word to carry them through this religious life. Nothing could be further from the truth. The scripture itself says that it furnishes us to every good work, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, and it gives us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Through those two passages, what else do we need? We just simply need the word of God. It completely furnishes us, as we've already made mention of in 2 Timothy 3, verse 17. In fact, we got this word as, we're, as it's described in 2 Peter chapter 1, in verse 20 and 21, that holy men of God spake or were carried along. You know, the will of God came not by men, by the way of men, but holy men of God were carried by God. It was inspired, and they wrote it down for us so that we could have it. We also have a couple of other passages that tell us that the word of God is powerful. I think of, of Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Paul there says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Did you know that word power uh, comes from the Greek word dionymos, which is where we get our word dynamite? You know, and also there's another passage that we have access to, and that's Hebrews chapter 4. And if you'd like to turn over to that passage with me, let's read it together. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse uh, 12. <clears throat> There it says, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of a heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Can't we see from this passage how important God's word is? The, the fact that it's quick uh, it, it makes us alive, it's powerful, it's sharp, it cuts, and, uh, and so we not, do not need to take lightly uh, how important God's Word is and the authority that is found in God's Word. In Psalm 119 and verse 9, there we learn that the Word is there for our cleansing, for the cleansing of the young man. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 22 through 25, we learn there that the Word of God purifies the soul. In uh, Acts chapter 20 and verse 32, the word is there to build one up. So we see the value, the benefit of the complete and unified and indestructible word of God. In James chapter 1 and verse 25, there we uh, read about the perfect law of liberty. Perfect, not, not only in the sense of the fact that it is pure and perfect in that sense, that it's exactly the way God would have it, but pure also in the sense of maturity. We also learn that Christ has all authority. Remember Matthew 28 and verse 18 when Jesus, after his resurrection, he said unto, unto the disciples there, he said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. We know that, uh, that God speaks to us through that all authoritative word. In Hebrews uh, chapter 1, since we're close by there, we ought to take a look at it. Hebrews chapter 1. In verses 1 and 2, it says, God, who at sundry or various times and in diverse or different manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And so Christ has this authority. His, uh, he has this authoritative word. Uh, in fact, in Matthew chapter 7, remember when he finishes up his... Uh, his great sermon on the mount, and the people had respect to him. Why? Because he spoke as one having authority, not as the scribes. And in fact, I want, to, I want us to go ahead and go over to John chapter 12 uh, <clears throat> and verse 48 as we consider that passage because it's very, very important that we have an understanding uh, how sincere this passage is, and it should ring in our hearts to... Uh, to to help us understand the, the path that we need to be on. It says there, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not 
my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Well, you know, maybe we're just thinking, well, that's pretty arrogant that Jesus would say something like that. But take note. In verse 49, he says, for I have not spoken of myself. You see, he's not being arrogant. He's not spoken of himself, but the Father which hath sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that this commandment is life everlasting. So it's not out of arrogance or out of this, this thing, that, this idea that he stands over us with his thumb on us, that he's, you know, he's bearing down on us because we're just a sinful creature. No, he, he's telling us this message because he loves us. It's life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. And so we have this inspired, inerrant word of God, which is, which is complete and unified and indestructible. And Christ, who has all authority, is the one who gave us this word. Remember, as he said in John 17, 17, in that prayer, thy word is truth. And furthermore, you know, God's word can be understood you know, there's a, a, a contingency of folks out in the world today that, that think, well, it's just mysterious, it can't be understood, and so we just don't know. But when you take a look at Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, there the scripture says, how that by revelation he made known unto me, that is Paul, who's writing to the church at Ephesus, and made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Why? Because Paul told us and revealed what the revelation was. And so we can know. We just have to apply ourselves, and, and we need to know. You know, uh, you know the, the Jews, as we've already read there in Romans chapter, uh, chapter 3, how important it was. They were the vessels that were to carry God's word for the time that it was necessary for them to carry it out. Well, I tell you, what a... That's kind of a, an earth-shaking thought to have to carry God's Word, to protect God's Word. You are the ones who are, are maintaining that and, and, and seeing to its purity and carrying it out. I mean, there can't, there can't be a bigger responsibility, obligation, and privilege than to carry God's Word. Well, as Christians, we must follow and keep God's word ourselves. In fact, John uh, chapter 14 and verse 15, there Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments. If we love him, we're going to obey him. We're going to, to continue to keep God's word. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and, and verse 15, there Paul is writing to the church at Thessalonica, and he tells them to stand fast. And what are they to hold on to? The word. Hold on to the word, you see. In fact, Timothy was encouraged in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12 to be an example of the believers, those who were to hold on to the word, you see. And so the word of God is so powerful. It's so important. And, and you know, some people have coined these phrases to help us perhaps better understand Within the pages of the Bible are the answers to man's most pressing needs. I mean, you think about that question for just a minute. That, that the acronym B-I-B-L-E means basic instructions before leaving earth. You know, we, we, ought, to, we ought to sort of sit on that for a while and, and, and absorb the meaning behind those thoughts. In fact, in Jude chapter 3, there they were told to contend earnestly for the faith. Uh, Joshua was told to be strong and be of a good courage uh, as they were on, uh, as the Jews. And remember, they were carrying God's word. They were sort of the protectors, the security for God's word. And yet they were told to be strong and be of a good courage because they were fighting these uh, heathens and these, these countries that had no respect for God's word. And, uh, and so, you know, just by example, by illustration, uh, aren't we God's soldiers today? And we sing songs like soldiers of Christ arise, you know, and, and we're told to take on the whole armor of God, which we talked about a little bit about, Ephesians 6 and verse 17, to, to, to have that sword of the Spirit, which is God's word. But, you know, not only is it a great responsibility and obligation for 
for the Jews in their day to carry God's word as well as for us today. But, you know, with, with that responsibility comes the responsibility not to mishandle the word. Uh, in Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 through 19, there it tells us not to add to or to take away, in principle, from God's word. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 through 6, that we are not to add to God's word. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, there, Paul again writing to that young preacher Timothy, he says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, handling aright or rightly dividing the word of truth. And then we see in Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 through 9, and if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there with me as we read that particular passage, as we do see a people who were so soon removed from the gospel. In Galatians chapter 1, in verse 8, there is a warning from Paul. He says, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And he repeats it for emphasis. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than what you have, what, then you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Well, I tell you what, he, take, he took it very personally that he had to go and preach simply God's word. You know, there's an awful lot of religious groups and even within the brotherhood that are out seeking to, to give you flowery stories and, and feel-good stories. I, I know of some TV evangelists, and, you know, sometimes I'll watch them and, and you know, they have those, those pretty teeth and, and they're handsome people and they look good, don't they? And, uh, and, 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 you know, I'm not trying to, to judge them. I mean, God blessed them with a, with a beautiful body. Uh, and, and they talk, uh, oh, it's so sweet, sweet as honey. And it makes you feel so good about you being religiously minded. But, but take note, they don't teach the whole counsel of God as Paul did in Acts chapter 20. And, and it's a dangerous doctrine that they teach. It may make you feel good now, but it won't make you feel good later in the day of judgment. So we all have the responsibility to be careful about <clears throat> what is preached from the pulpit, what is preached in classrooms. Anytime somebody speaks as the oracles of God, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11, we must be careful. We need to have the mind of those uh, that we read about in Acts chapter 17 uh, and verse 10 and following. Notice this, it says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, that is the Bereans, in that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. You see, they were interested in knowing what the doctrine that Paul and his fellows were teaching, but they went to the scriptures to see if those things were so. And, uh, and we're not relieved of that responsibility. We've got to do that as well. So as much as what I say up here, you know, you've seen the double-check State Farm commercials? You need to double-check it, don't you? It's a responsibility and obligation that we all have that what comes from this pulpit and pulpits around the world and, and from our classrooms, that it is the pure, unadulterated Word of God, the authority that our Lord speaks, that's what we're going to be judged by, and we must follow it and keep it. Now, here's what I want to close with <clears throat> in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> Remember, we already presented information in Romans chapter 3 about how the Jews were responsible for carrying the oracles of God. Well, notice what is told here in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, 
we faint not. Now, as Paul is talking to the church at Corinth, you can already see how sincere and his desire and love for, for the ministry as he begins there in, in verse 1, seeing that we have this ministry as we have received mercy. Haven't we received mercy from God? And, and so we faint not. We don't get tired. We don't let our, our guard down. But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Right? We've put those things, we've renounced that, we've put it behind us. We're not walking in crafty, craftiness, as it says here, or, or with a desire to be deceitful, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. We're being out, we're being open, we're taking a look at God's word today and always. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And that's what we need to do. We need to take God's word and we need to just, we need to let God's word do the work. You know, as much as, as uh, many of us like to just give the answers to people who have religious questions, we just need to let them see what the answers are for themselves in God's word. Now, notice verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Isn't that a sad, sad commentary? If we hide the gospel, because why? We're ashamed? We don't have enough knowledge? Well, you know, if you don't have enough knowledge, there's a way to get over that. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God, notice the small g, the God of this world, and we know who that is, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of our glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Don't you remember there in Matthew chapter 5, let your light so shine before men? Why? That they may see your good works and glorify God which is in heaven. I tell you, it's, it's such a wonderful thing to be, to be in Christ, to be a servant of God, to be able to live a life full of examples so people can glorify God. I hope we're living that way and that we are sharing the gospel of Christ in that way. You know, our example, and you know, I've had a sermon before. We talked about the little things. The little things can mean so much in our efforts to teach the gospel, to let our light shine. It could be as simple as a smile. It could be just that, that opening of a door for somebody when you go to the grocery. Well, I guess groceries have the automatic doors now, don't they? You know. Back in the day when I grew up, you know, you had to actually push them open, kids. <laughs> but there's things that we can do. It might be just saying a simple hello. The little things can help plant the seed that we're trying to, trying to do in this community and the world over. And, and if we don't do that, the God of this world has the opportunity to snatch them out of the hand of God. And we don't want that to happen. We need to let our light so shine before men. Verse 5, for we preach not ourselves. You know, this isn't about us. No, if it is, we're wrong and we need to get that straight. But Christ Jesus is who we preach. The Lord, it says, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, and brethren, we live in a mighty dark world, and we need to let our light so shine. I just, I, you know, I like that little song that we sing with the kids, this little light of mine. I'm, you know, when we had our uh, interactive Bible study, we sang that song as part of our singing. I think the, one of the kids asked for it. That's a wonderful song, and we need to... That's a good song. We know that song. And, you know, you need to keep that in your mind. We are a light for God. God commanded our light to shine throughout this darkness. And it hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And isn't that what we're talking about right here? The knowledge of God cover to cover, every page. And that's what we have, and what a great privilege and honor it is that, that we have this. But listen to verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That's right. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. 
If not, if there ever was a verse that said we need to we need to tell people what God's word says, not what we think, that's it. The power of God unto salvation. Verse eight: We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest. In our body. That's right. Nevertheless I live. Yet not I but Christ liveth in me. You see? There it goes. All about that example that we have. And the opportunity that we have. Brethren what verse 7 says. Is that we are now. uh, Empowered with the responsibility. The obligation and the privilege. To carry God's word to the world. Just like the Jews were, but today it's Christians. It's the new Israel, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 16. Oh, man, if, if we, can't, if we could, could grasp this and, and understand how important it is that, that we are the earthen vessels that carry God's word to the world, I think we would be more in, uh, encouraged, more uh, desirous of trying to take in as much of God's word as possible because it's through us that that God's word is given to the world so that God can save them. If we don't save souls, you know, Paul planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. Well, brethren, when the seed is cast, that's what we do. We're, we're seed casters. And others come behind us and they water. And if that fall, that seed falls on good soil, God will give the increase. And you know, you just never know when that one person that you opened the door for nodded your head and said, morning, isn't it a lovely day? And all of a sudden that person might write a book that talks about his experience where he obeyed Christ, was baptized in water for the remission of sins, and then that book is cast and written in different languages and other souls are saved. You know, we're studying a book like that in our Wednesday night class. Fascinating. It's a wonderful book. If you've not read it yet, I would encourage you to read it. It's called Muscle and a Shovel. I see people shaking their head. Yeah, It's a pretty fantastic book. Even for, if you're already a Christian, it, it, it will renew you, revive you. It will get you motivated again. I encourage you to read it. But you know, it's all based on this book right here. The author would tell you that. That's right. So we encourage you to be a, a student of the Bible. Uh, there's opportunities. There's Bible class. Uh, there's midweek Bible study. There's uh, other opportunities for, for studying, inter- uh, gospel meetings and, and uh, interactive Bible studies and things of that sort. And, and then there's just personal Bible study. You just can't replace that, you know, and opportunities for that. So if you're not mixed up and wrapped up in doing that, we would encourage you to do so. <laughs> there's just nothing better than that. It is God's Word after all. And it does have the answer to man's most pressing needs. What is that most pressing need? It's the salvation of your soul. And we know because of what the scripture teaches that every one of us must read the scripture to develop a faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. You can't get a faith without God's word. And once you have that faith, once you are beginning to develop that faith, you will see the need to follow through with other commands that our Lord has made. He wants you to change your life. That is repent. He says, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. Well, who wants to perish? Nobody really in their right mind wants to perish. So change your life. Turn around. Repent is the word that we use. And then we have the example of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8 who confessed that Jesus is the Son of God and and uh, Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. And then we move on from there, and Jesus, and throughout the whole book of Acts, we see that men and women, those who were capable of learning, understanding, and believing, they believed, they repented, and they were baptized for the remission of their sins. Jesus says, whosoever, uh, I'm sorry, Uh, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So we just simply 
throw out the seed and the gospel call to you today if you're not yet a Christian, won't you do those things before it's too late? And for those of us that are Christians, do we not see the responsibility, the glorious and wonderful responsibility we have as Christians to carry God's word as these earthen vessels? He's put us in charge of that. Who else is he going to put in charge of that except good people like you? And so we need to, we need to take that charge. Remember what Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4? He says, I charge you, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering." Well, really, that charge is to all of us, not just people who stand up behind a pulpit. So consider that. If you're ready, if you need more encouragement, if you need more study, you let us know. If you need prayers on your behalf, let us know. There's others in here who said, you know what, I've, I've let God down, I've let myself down, and you know, maybe I just don't, maybe I just can't do what he needs me to do. What? No, we don't want you to go down that road. We, we've all been down that road and we've overcome. God wants you. God needs you. Can't you see that in the scripture? It's time to ask for prayers of encouragement on your behalf. Let us say words that can build you up. Let us go before God's great and mighty throne. Who can help you better than he can? Only he can. And so if you need to come for your soul's sake, we make this time a convenient time for you to do that. If you're ready to take on Christ in baptism, please let us know. If you need prayers on your behalf, please let us know. Let's sing the song of encouragement. Consider the words, and if you can come, won't you come?